You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Is your wallet a little lighter than usual after the holiday season? Consider it money well spent because you deserve to live your best life and the Chime Checking Account wants to help you live yours to the fullest. A little extra money goes a long way, which is why the Chime Checking Account has tons of benefits that millions of members love, like fee-free overdraft up to $200 for eligible members no monthly fees, and access to over 60,000 easy-to-find and fee-free ATMs. You even get paid up to two days early with direct deposit, all while managing your money on the go, including sending and receiving money fee-free with friends that aren't even on Chime. Sign up for Chime today for you and your wallet. Get started at Chime.com slash Goals24. That's Chime.com slash Goals24. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Access to direct deposits up to two days early depends on the timing of the submission of the payment file from the payer. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. Today, I'm joined by Yas Huba, the creative director of the World War I game series, uh, which has a new entry coming out in early 2022 called Isonzo. Yas, how's it going today? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for, uh, for having me. Uh, we're still uh, very busy with, uh, with all the stuff we need to do for the launch. Uh, so I've uh, <laughs> uh, been very busy with that. Um, we're a small team, so there's lots to do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending some time to come chat with me today. And so one of the things that I found quite remarkable over the years, and I kind of have a personal connection with video games and and how it shaped my interest in history over the course of my life, but the video games of the World War I game series, and particularly Verdun and and Tannenberg, are really important to to a lot of people who, you know, enjoy history. They get pointed to to people who want to learn more about about the First World War and and what it was like. So could you talk a little bit about the earlier games in the series and kind of how the series came about and why you picked some of the topics that maybe that were chosen for for the games? Yeah, so to give a somewhat of an overview of uh, where we we came from whenever or when I was little, uh, I visited the uh, Verdun battlefields uh, on a, a holiday in uh, uh, actually with friends who were amateur archaeologists in the area. That was like in the, in the last century when I was like a 10 year old. But it was very, uh, it's very impressive uh, to see those uh, trenches and craters in the forest still around with all sorts of grenades and uh, bones still sticking out of the ground. Uh, very, very um very impressive as as a little uh, boy. So ever since then, sort of had a fascination with the uh, with the uh, subject, and I wanted to do something with it. Uh, so uh, when I was in high school, I did uh, mods for for games, uh, Command and Conquer Generals, and uh, Medal of Honor, and made some was part of World War One uh, teams. And then in uh, in college, when I met uh, the boys from uh, M2H, we decided to make a a bigger standalone project, uh, which then grew to be uh, Verdun. And it, yeah, it sort of uh, was just the three of us uh, creating the game for for quite a long time, and it uh, grew out into Verdun, uh, in, uh, which uh, launched into Steam Early Access on uh, in 2013, eventually. Yeah, that was that was still in the, in the early days, and and I've always had the 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 idea to do something with with World War One, and you know, get all the the aspects of World War One in into the into the game, uh, all the fronts. So, uh, I think correctly, 2015, we went out of Erlex with Ferdun. Uh, we extended the game, added uh, the, expanded to the Western Front as much as possible. We, we started small with just the French and the uh, and the Germans, because um, it's named Ferdun, and we had those factions. We extended Ferdun to be bigger, added uh, Belgians, Americans, etc. Uh, and then in 2017, we started with the production of uh, of Tannenberg, uh, the Eastern Front. First as in a DLC, but then we decided to make it a standalone game to give it its own game mode, specifically tied into uh, into the uh, the maneuver warfare. We c- we can go into the details about that later, but uh, we just whole game design based around basically the 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 whole uh, the, the way of warfare. So that that finished in 2019. We did the console versions. Now we're working on uh, game three, with completely built around uh, the Italian front and the Alpine warfare. V- very cool. So 
it sounds like the the timing of your games releasing around the centenary uh, of the war was more of kind of a, an accident almost and, and not necessarily planned from the beginning. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember we were working we've been working on Ferdun, you know, you know, with the three and with the three of us uh, uh, since uh, 2006. Uh, and I remember the father of one of the Antwerp uh, of the Antwerp brothers. She said, like, "Oh yeah, you're gonna be you're finishing uh, uh, the game when the centennial is there in 2014." I was like, "Oh, that's so." Uh, <laughs> oh, we've done way before that, but of course, uh, the reality of game development. I mean, these games are like normally you you know dice. They're they're with you know 300 people in an office. They have like thousands of people working on it. We're like <laughs> the three of the three of you. So uh, uh, my my uh, expectations were vaguely uh, optimistic. Uh, still am a bit uh, like that. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just really an accident. Uh, we got some benefits uh, from that because people. The general press is more being more interested, uh, especially when we did the um, the Christmas truce uh, parts that got also picked up by uh, I think the Daily Mail or something in England. They mm-hmm. they put it on their front page during Christmas, so it was, that was interesting uh, to get that kind of mainstream uh, attention. Uh, that was all through the centennial. So uh, w- when you moved to to Tannenberg, and you kind of mentioned that that you brought it out into its own game because it represented something very different with a different game mode and kind of a, a very different feel. What were some of the historical things you were kind of highlighting sort of in that game mode? For Tannenberg specifically, mm-hmm. well, yeah. for Tannenberg, we wanted to, okay, take one step back. Uh, for then, of course, uh, the trench warfare was uh, very important. So we, we wanted to do the, the back and forth uh, struggle. Our games are always very intense. The, the action is very, very action packed. We're not, you have to, don't have to walk for 10 kilometers to get to combat. You're, uh, you're very, uh, you're spawned in and you're in the trench next to the enemy. And that's very, uh, Stronger is very close combat. That's sort of the, the core DNA of uh, of our game. So with with Ferdun, the back and forth, the trench warfare, uh, the, the rules we we set there were uh, attack, counter attack. Uh, so you take the trench, you have to uh, fend off against counter attack. You, you see this in represent, represented in in uh, media as well, or in 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 in, uh, in movies. Uh, you know, inspiration, uh, the Indiana Jones where they take the trench and then they have to, the, the counter attack comes. So maybe uh, the listeners will probably uh, relate to that. And but also things like Passchendaele, etc. You see this. Uh, so that that was a clear example that we we brought that in. Um, you know, the the battles of the Somme and and, and uh, Verdun were very characterized by this kind of uh, horrible uh, attrition of waves of men crashing into each other and then moving the the tide of war either one way or the other. Um, so the symmetrical uh, trench warfare. For Tannenberg, then we uh, we said, oh, what, what did we see? What are the most uh, char- characteristic uh, battles of the Eastern Front? Well, Tannenberg itself with the massive encirclements. It's, it's also a trope in general. There's more space. You see this even uh, in World War II, you know, with the major encirclements of uh, you know, Stalingrad, Kiev, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of a trope of fighting on the Eastern Front, this massive encirclements, Shemish, uh, the fortress being encircled. So we, yeah, we really wanted to give that a proper uh, representation. So we, we built a game mode around that where you have different sectors and you can encircle. And of course, the landscape itself uh, is way more uh, uh, l- less linear, endless pine forests or fields or uh, desolate Polish villages, etc., which where you have lots of room to maneuver. But, so that, that that's the approach we took there. And for the Italian front, we have a, a similar approach uh, where we uh, take okay Alpine warfare. We know the Italians had uh, great trouble with uh, cutting the wire, you know, pushing uh, up uh, up mountains. So the, the verticality is a big thing there. Um, so we, we take basically the most characteristic elements of a front and try to uh, distill that into a into a gameplay that that, that represents that. Yeah, I I. I uh... I really liked the idea of Tannenberg, uh, of bringing the game off of the Western Front, off of the kind of stereotypical battlefields of, of just, you know, a bunch of guys in trenches uh, that, that you see in Verdun and a lot of the Western Front. And so moving it to Asanzo also, you know, brings a lot of interesting landscape and interesting opportunities for, for changes. But what kind of, what was kind of, where did the idea of moving to the Italian front come from? Was that kind of the, been the plan for a while? I know you've been trying to get to different theaters. Uh, what sort of drew, drew the team to Asanzo and what, what do you think makes it really interesting to, to model in a game and, and also from history? Well, I wanted to do the Italian front since we started because it's the most uh, scenic for sure. And I've had a, I started in Italy for a bit and uh, uh, really, you know, the whole, um, Scenery is uh, very appealing, um, especially if you uh, travel there. But yeah, tech, uh, t- 
tech-wise, it's hard. The, the verticality and the, the way the trenches are sort of carved out into the into the landscape. That's yeah, you need that justice. It it you need certain technical requirements. And we didn't quite have that when we finished Verdun. So the the eastern front was sort of the more um, the easier uh, option because it's open forest. Uh, so it was less of a tech uh, requirement. And of course, East Front being the sort of larger um, chunk of the war. Um, also, uh, it, Iron Front, with all the respect, of course, for the fighting that went on there, a stalemate for pretty much uh, uh, the entirety uh, of, yeah, okay, of course, Caporetto and Piave, but uh, other than that, pretty much uh, still, uh, still operation. So, uh, in terms of uh, influence on, on the bigger on the outcome of the war, uh, of course, Western Front is the is the uh, took the priority. It's also the most iconic, um, also the most representative. Uh, so yeah, that, that that's why we did uh, Italy after um, after uh, Eastern Front. Um. I guess I never thought about the fact that as a small development team, when you were making Verdun, the kind of destroyed landscape uh, of the Western Front battlefields actually removes a lot of kind of game development overhead around trees and and similar types of uh, structures and and other uh, things that you would have to place in the game world. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, basically uh, trenches, uh, different varieties of trenches, because even in Verdun, we try to make a sort of uh, a diversity of environments. So the, f- the flooded fields in, in Flanders are quite different from Vosges or uh, Picardy. So, you know... It, yeah, maybe for the for the uh, the untrained eye, it all looks the same as a brown drab. But I can <laughs> see the different different shades of uh, of that. Uh, whether you're you're in a, in the Vosges Mountains in the in the trees uh, versus uh, the, the battlefields around Verdun or or in Picardy, which have their own characteristic. Uh, so we, yeah, we, in that way we try to make a diverse team, and that's the same we did for uh, for Tannenberg. Uh, it's hard because there's even more generic in ways like oh, there's all pine forests and, and empty fields. Uh, uh, how do you portray that uh, accurately? We try to make make it as diverse as possible. I, I mean, our selection of of uh, levels, uh, the way we selected the levels in front and is also we spread out as much as possible across the the entire front, rather than pick the you know the three most uh, famous battles in uh, in on the Somme and in in Ferdun. So you have Flanders, Vosges, uh, but on the Eastern Front, different biome versus uh, say uh, Eastern Media, which is totally different. So you have, we have a sort of uh, try to spread it out as much as possible and create the most diversity within uh, what we're, we can do while still be somewhat ac- accurate to the the uh, and representing it uh, as accurate as possible. Um, we always try to to be as representative as possible, so not cherry pick too much uh, the um, the events. Um, for for uh, the is also however we we are taking a slightly different approach. So. Uh, where we are representing specific battles and specific dates um, and recreating that as uh, accurate as possible. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Overdraft fees are just the worst. Get up to 200 in fee-free overdraft with the Chime checking account. Sign up today at Chime.com slash Goals24. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. Members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Hmm. 
So these games, you know, bring in a, a lot of history, and that's one of the reasons I know that I'm sure a lot of your fans really like that. Um, so what is kind of the process of going from you had these historical events, you know, how, how are you researching? How are you picking out uh, things that you want to bring into the game that, that you think really represent? So on the Asanzo, you know, what kind of pieces do you feel you have to bring into the game to kind of capture the the feel and the history of those events? Yeah, there's not a lot of material uh, available on the town front to begin with. There's only a handful of English books, uh, unfortunately. And or there are, you know, small footnotes in bigger documentaries or uh, it's like, OK, they fight here. And then, <laughs> you know, they, they talk about fighting on the town front. They talk about, oh, the towns were tried to get past the Sonto 11 times, but then they show footage of um, Alpine, you know, where they did lift mm-hmm. cannons up the highest uh-huh. peaks, which is not really representative of the Italian front, to my understanding, and also to the facts, uh, where mm-hmm. uh, 90% of the casualties and attacks were done in the lower Sonto near the uh, Adriatic coast. So that area was, uh, uh, took a lot of the focus. And uh, our, again, as I said before, our... our, our or my intent is to at least be as representative as possible for the conflict as well and not cherry pick. So we're not, you know, taking the coolest looking mountains and then base the entire game around that. But the, actually the uh, the Carso being sort of most boring uh, looking uh, part of the uh, Italian front um, will get the, the main highlight because that's where the uh, action happens. Uh, so you have, there's within game development, there's, and, and in the media in general, you have you, you as the creator have the ability to shed light or not on certain aspects. Uh, so it's it's always hard because it's it's always a, a t- tight balance because you, you on one hand you do want to do justice by it, but the reality is often quite boring. You know, if if you were to do real justice by the Western Front, ninety percent of the fighting was done in you know a, a ditch uh, in in the middle of a uh, farm field with nothing around it. If you if you drive north of Paris, just you know, it's just uh, endless fields of uh, crops, and and that's where the fighting took place in Picardy. So that's it. You you have your trench in the, in the middle of mud. That's it. that's ninety percent of it. So, uh, you know, you have to sort of balance that uh, with with the reality, or the reality versus uh, gameplay and, and aesthetics. So um, that's that's a tight tight balance. Uh, luckily in Italy, it's slightly easier to do that because you know. If the, even on the car, so you have uh, say Monte Sabatino, which is uh, uh, we were not too long ago. Um, we did a, a tour on the Italian front, and you have the, the giant uh, bridge there. It's also featured in the, in the trailer. Uh, the, the, the big river; uh, those are uh, luckily also there in in that region. So in that way, you have to to cherry pick a bit within the the, the parameters that, that we set for for ourselves. Um, yeah, I. Uh... I end up in a lot of conversations with people around video games and how they represent history and and things like that. And my favorite example is always that if you were to make a realistic Western front game, uh, there would be a lot of players with like sacks full of grenades and nobody likes a video game where there's people with like 20 grenades that they can throw at you because that's very annoying. (laughs) Yeah, 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 we we did some. Yeah, we had some classes in Verdun, which actually had uh, the only thing you got was like a shovel and uh, six grenades. So and people like that. It's so it's so atypical. I like being a grenadier, even in say Call of Duty or something. Uh, uh, probably get a lot of hate for this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> even in a playtest, uh, uh, it, it is also I like to be the grenadier. Um, I'm not so, I'm not a very skilled FPS player. Yeah, I mean, if you were to be really purist about being uh, as accurate as possible, you know you. 90% of the time would be wading, digging latrines, and you know <laughs> uh, that would be the, the 90%, and you know 10% is uh, is action. Specifically, trench warfare by definition is in action. I always wonder when people are kind of embarking on, on these kind of entertainment creation things, like video games or these games specifically, where you know they are hewing closer to history. Like when you are sort of researching and designing, do you feel any kind of like responsibility to represent history accurately or correctly or you feel any responsibility for kind of what people are taking away from the game that you're creating yeah absolutely absolutely uh especially with this because i i feel like in some ways i'm breaking new grounds with the Italian front there's i i can create i i've basically the power to create the way people view the Italian front in popular culture because there's i i don't think there's any there's no blockbusters on the Italian front uh I think there was maybe a Hemingway, uh, a movie about Hemingway in a, way back with, when, and there's a couple of movies in, from the 70s and uh, a movie uh, set in the high Alps, but uh, 
yeah, that, that's that's about it. So, um, uh, and of course, there's Battlefield One, which did, uh, uh, did their thing. Uh, we can go into detail about the, how they did that, but uh, yeah, in a, in a way, I'm <laughs> I have to decide what's what gets highlighted. So, uh, yeah, it, it was kind of uh, I it took a long time picking the the, the locations we did. Went over it, uh, books and. So yeah, that, that does uh, put a little bit of weight uh, for the Western Front and uh, the Eastern Front was kind of e- is easier because there's more material. But it's clear what the, the major battles were versus the the minor battles. Yeah, for the for the Eastern Front, that that's that's not as clear. There's a lot of mountains, <laughs> obviously, but uh, uh, with also with lots of similar names. They have there have been names in in three different languages. Some in sometimes in some cases, uh, Slovenian, German, and Italian, uh, and they're all mixed. It's, it's kind of fuzzy, uh, fuzzy in a lot of ways, uh, and also uh, especially the battles in on the higher Alp and the higher Alps. They're by and large done by a very small amount of troops. Um, in the, even getting up there is just hard. Uh, so uh, uh, you can imagine like transporting a hundred thousand troops to k- kilometer high. That's just not going to happen. So um, uh, in that way, we also try to you know. Pick locations that are representative, but also nice looking. So there's a balance there. Um, took me quite, uh, took me months to to make a decision about that. Uh, the, the producer said, "Yeah, we need to make a decision now. We need to start production." <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, yeah, luckily to get some help from reenactors, and yeah, there's there's some help from the community as well, especially when it comes to to details. But yeah, this, this was this was uh, kind of my on my on my plate. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure some people say no, but this is actually a better oh, for sure. You know, in, in history, and that's been the case since we started Ferdun, is people expect us to be accurate. Even if we want, like, we wouldn't have gotten away with it. Like, if we wanted to make some Call of Duty semi-fantasy fantasy stuff, that, yeah, people just expect us to be realistic. Especially if you're breaking new grounds and you you, you are somewhat claiming to be accurate, then people expect you to go all the way with it. We get comments of anecdotally of, uh, yeah, button on the uniform was just not high enough or the, the metal was not worn here, but it's here instead. Like it's that level of detail we're getting feedback on. So mm-hmm. um, typically indicator that you're doing something right is not like, oh, you shouldn't have a pink uniform. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, that, that's interesting. It's, it's like, it's like a challenge of, of balancing the requirements uh, of an audience that that is deeply interested and and deeply passionate about the history, with the fact that again this this is a video game and, and there are finite amounts of things that you can do as a development team <laughs> when creating that game. Yeah, exactly. We have it's all it's it's over always a, a budget. Uh, we're a small team, so uh, we can. We can only do so much. But then again, uh, a lot of our artists, for instance, really uh, who does the uniforms himself, also really uh, a World War One geek. So he's, you know, um, <laughs> uh, he also wants the same thing. And uh, a lot of uh, people in the team have the same uh, feeling as well. So it's not just me constantly uh, uh, saying, "Oh, you need this needs to be more accurate." It's, it's kind of organic to um, to a lot of these projects. Um, yeah, and that. Having two members with with at least a, a a solid interest in a lot of those topics probably just makes conversations a lot easier uh, around what you're doing and and what you're going for in the design. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't. We, it's also we don't have a, a corporate overlord per se. So it's a, like, for instance, in Battlefield, they had to make a lot of decisions, you know, based on oh, we're going to monetize a certain. We have to be, you know, the marketing material has to has certain requirements. So in that way, we're kind of liberating because we're mm-hmm. uh, independent. So that that helps. You mentioned earlier, we were talking just briefly about sort of classes in your game. And one of the things I was curious about for Asanzo is, you know, there's a lot of sort of specialized troops that that are there on the Italian front, especially, you know, you're talking about those very high mountains and the small number of troops that are involved in that. So are you guys modeling that in your game and, and sort of how are you approaching the the specialized nature of some of the troops involved? Yeah, we've taken a bit of a different approach with uh, with Asanto versus uh, Ferdinand Tannenberg. Ferdinand Tannenberg had really a uh, class system, uh, which are pretty much the same for both uh, games. Um, they, they, you have this specific squad, and they had this type, and within the squad there were roles. Uh, with Asanto, we're, we're making the class system a bit more um, flexible. So you have classes you can pick. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be in a squad, um, specific squad. So that just makes the experience a bit more accessible. We found that... Uh, so uh, yeah, Isonzo is basically the uh, an improvement on all of the all almost all aspects of the the game if, or the the series are improved with this. This is one of those points. I think the freer class system helps with that. Uh, that said, we do have so we have officer, 
we have class limits also. You, you, it's not like you can have 20 officers. Uh, there's, there's only uh, two officers available per, per side. So that they can influence the battle. Then uh, mountaineers are a big thing. So you have a specifically dedicated uh, uh, slot to a mountaineer. Outlined it in a in a blog recently, where yeah, we found the mountaineer had to be represented somehow. First of all, uh, visually, the specialist mountain troops like the Alpini troops uh, had to be um, had to have their own class. So uh, so they move quicker around the terrain. They're more um, trained to to alpine warfare. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we, we introduced a, a vaulting system where you can climb over uh, over stuff. They do that f- faster. Uh, you can special there's the different abilities or perks, uh, so to speak, uh, that you can select and you can specialize it even more. So yeah, moving faster. Uh, they also do uh, reconnaissance, uh, climbing faster. Uh, they have uh, lighter uh, equipment. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's the the extent of the the mountaineer class. Um, probably forgetting something now but uh, <laughs> uh and then there's the uh, the assault troops uh with sp- specialized equipment uh, engineers are a big thing um especially the, the uh, as i mentioned in the beginning the whole dynamic with uh, the wire which i wanted to we wanted to put in in Ferdun and the, the whole you know thing of cutting the wire repairing it uh that's we, we double down on it in in this game so uh each line has a, a layer of wire which i can uh, in front of each each sector so you basically progress through a, a map <clears throat> across a, on to, uh, to the top of a mountain typically and then each line is or each defensive line is a, basically a, a wire um, a belt in front of it which has certain holes uh, in it which are vulnerable and that can be repaired or uh, or uh, cut or destroyed depending on yeah, what the players do. So engineers can blow it up, uh, but others can only cut it uh, and engineers can only repair it. Um, so you create this interesting dynamic of uh, repairing the wire and um, um, trying to get through it. <clears throat> interesting. I, I could definitely see in my limited knowledge of, of video game development of why that would be a, a feature you would want to have and also maybe why it would get cut <laughs> from the other games if, if, if you didn't have a big enough team. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just the whole how you sync, synchronize these things. Uh-huh. And, uh, so we have a whole new building system where you can actually build your own uh, sets of wire freely. So th- th- this is on top of the, the wire belt system that we have. So we have fixed wire belts, which has certain uh, slots in it. But then there's also uh, players can also build their own sandbags, uh, etc. So uh, we've we've extended that uh, simply because in, tra- in trans warfare, you can construction was a big thing building your own little fortification of course it's all sort of a dis- distillation of what would happen in real life or that you know building your own machine gun nest takes quite a long time but here it's done in a much shorter uh, compact uh... so uh i've been following this game for a little bit on, on social media and stuff so i've seen some of your marketing materials i i am led to understand that mustaches on characters are a big part of this game can you talk about the importance of the mustache on on players in this game. Yeah, it started off as uh, we wanted to do something with, with the character customization and the different troops. Uh, in in Verdun Dynamic Works, we have the squads, so, and then you level the squads, and then within that, you had the customization uh, progression. In turn front, uh, uh, uniform progression is not as drastic as on, on uh, say, uh, the French with their red coats versus later war, totally different pickle hours. It's a bit more um, fudge, especially Austro and Garens. They were just ragtag force of you know, whatever they could find it through on uniform mixtures, etc. So Italian didn't change that much, uh, slightly different helmets. But, you know, since they joined in a bit later, their progression is, of course, uh, a, bit, a bit more capped. So in that way, we took the liberty of making the customization system a bit more flexible. And so we, we could do that with this game. So yeah, the mustaches are a part of that. So yeah, it, uh, uh, it's like, <laughs> we went we went full out on this. We had, there's like, I think in total about 50 mustaches, and we're all based them on on historical figures. So uh, you know, Conrad von Hutzendorf, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> different different shit. They all have unique shapes. Uh, so um, yeah, that's cool, and it's also uh, allows us to uh, to tell a bit about history. It's not just random shapes. Uh, it's also a way of like, oh, this obs- German general you never heard of perhaps before, and uh, it has a reference in the game. This person you never heard of had an amazing mustache, and now you will learn about them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about, you know, making uh, sure that the features that we do put in have some kind of historical, kind of, or pull in some, at least some uh, reference to a historical thing. So this is another opportunity to do exactly yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I think it's it's an example of a, of a really fun way to introduce more history, but also make it you know fun and interesting to to kind of bring it in there in, in 
that's how you get people interested in these events. And that's when they go off and do more research. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit uh, goofy when you uh, think or when you see it and you see the mustache in the, in the video we made. It's like sort of swapping out and then they get they get weirder. But uh, of course, there were a lot of different facial hairs uh, at the time. And you can see that on uh, the photos of all the officers. And uh, so it was really a thing then. So, yeah. So thank you so much for, for coming here and chatting with me uh, about about Asanzo and kind of the 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 past and, and I guess future at this point of the World War One game series. It's been uh, it's been a great talk. And also, again, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but I do know a, a lot of people who are really interested in the First World War play these games and have spoken with me about them and, and how they have shaped or changed their interest in the First World War. So, you know, g- good job, I guess. Yeah. Th- yeah. Thanks for, uh, for having me. I like.